All right. Hello, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. In tonight's video, it's going to be one of our shareables based on the request of some comments that I had received uh, from some of the shorts that I'd been putting out. So some of the shorts, there was a recent one in relation to uh, Luke in order. So this short shareable, <laughs> maybe an hour or so long, is going to be a breakdown, detailed, but trying not to go overboard, but to make it clear as to what it means when Luke in chapter one tells us that he knew all things in order from the very beginning. We revealed that it means the first four chapters of Luke. That is the mystery hidden within the first four chapters of Luke connected to what he was saying. And it's all about prophecy. Imagine saying that. And it gets written down in scripture that you had perfect understanding and knew all things in order from the very beginning. Well, that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to reveal what that is. We're going to show how it connects to other pieces of the scripture. And I'm prayerfully going to do it within a period of time that is reasonable for people to watch fully, to share. And hopefully you guys will like, share it, and subscribe for those who are watching without subscribing. All right. And um, what is today? Today is the 26th, but this uh, of October 2023, it probably won't be out until the 28th. Got to give time for this video to uh, to get its time in. It's a long video and it's packed with teaching. So hopefully people will will dig into the rest of those as well. Um, before I get started, I also want to share this. This is our sister Yolanda. So you'll hear me in videos talk about uh, the forum that we have. So if anybody wants to join us in the Ministry Revealed forum, uh, you just go to ministryrevealed.com, go to the forum in the menu, take you a few seconds to sign up. There's shares, there's you know news and events and watching and prayer requests and, and Bible studies and questions and all sorts of things going on in there. And this is what was shared, one of the things shared in there today. One of our great sisters, Yolanda, uh, has had major issues with car it takes her out for work and everything else, and uh, she's down and out. So our brother Brian set up a GoFundMe page for her, and so she needs some work. I don't know if she's getting work for her car or if she's getting a new car, uh, uh, just a, a, a different car, because obviously uh, blown, transmit, uh, uh, blown engine, uh, you're probably better getting a different car. So there's a GoFundMe set up for her. Uh, to be able to find it, I'm going to go to the share just to help you find it. And you can go to this right here, just so you guys can all see it on the screen. You can see it, HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash GoFund, uh, sorry, GoFund.me forward slash three zero lowercase c eight lowercase c lowercase f lowercase e four. So if you want to send her something, type in that into even just a Google search. And it will bring it up. And just so you know, you've got the right one. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is it right here. So anybody who is uh, who is feeling uh, led, please help her out. Uh, a number of us here have helped her out. And I know more are going to be helping, including myself. So if we can help her there some more and get her to reach that goal so she can get a vehicle here real quick, that would be appreciated. Uh, she's a, a wonderful sister, and uh, I'd love that we can help her in doing this. So with that, let's get started. We are going to start here so that people can grasp and understand what it is that we're talking about and how it plays out. And the reason we're starting here, for, there's two reasons. One is because in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, it lays out the picture of the end of days in a big picture. And it does something else for us as well. Well, the other reason is I share it a lot when it comes to the shorts. When it comes to the shorts, I always like to give people a foundation of the revelation of the end of days. And there's nothing better than 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Most people, and like 99.9999% of the people read this in the world of church. And they say, well, this is what Paul did when he went and did this and he was doing that. And that's, I'm not disagreeing with that. The issue is you're looking through the eyes of the is, okay? The Old Testament from creation to Christ is the was. 
from Christ until the moment of the pre-trib is the is. And from the pre-trib to the end is the is to come. And so there's the was and the is, and they both play out in typologies as for, as uh, Ecclesi as Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9 says, what was shall be, what is shall be. Meaning in the Old Testament, in the things that were, in the New Testament, in the things that have taken place, they're both giving us prophetic insight into the is to come. And we call that having end time eyes. And when you see this in what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, when you really look at it, you'll understand. Because people will say, well, this is when Paul went to heaven the first time. This is when Paul went to heaven the second time. And then he's also talking about the third time now he's going to come to them. Well, it just so happens there's a taking, a taking, and a return because pre-trib, mid-trib, and post-trib are all true. And that's what it reveals here and over the number of years it takes place. And one of the things that I've been sharing on this recently is just the wording alone should tell you the prophetic insight into it. You should see it. In verse 2, it says, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years. This We're going to talk about this briefly in a moment. But this is in Christ. So this is this is somebody who, and it relates, even though it's it's Paul talking, it's a prophetic picture of the pre-trib group who are a group of people in Christ, spirit-filled like Romans 8 tells us. That's who this group is. And these are the ones in Christ. And there's a portion of time above 14 years. And this is the one called, not the rapture, okay? Not was caught up, but like similar to a rapture. So this first group that is going like a rapture is going to the third heaven, okay? The pre-trib group is going to the third heaven, and it's going to happen at this period that starts the above. And we're going to show that to you in Luke in order. And so this is the pre-trib, and it's a group in Christ in the portion before the 14 years. Then he says, I knew a man. Then he says, sorry, I knew such a man. Well, this word such is the same word like. So it's not the same one like in Christ. That's that's really important. That would mean if you're trying to say that this is Paul and he's just trying to explain the times he went to heaven to this group of people over the period of days, uh, over years, you're missing the prophetic insight. Because wouldn't you say Paul was in Christ? Of course he was. Would you say that he wasn't really like the first one that was in Christ, but he's kind of sort of, you know, he believes, but he's not fully in Christ like the first one? That would be preposterous. Of course Paul was in Christ. You see, because he's giving us a prophetic picture within the story. And we see that this one was caught up, and this one goes to paradise. The pre-trib is above and the 14 years. The mid-trib, we've revealed through many different teachings, is in the seventh year of seals, right? 14 years. It's seven years of seals, seven years of trumpets. How did everybody miss it? Well, they were all taught from the Gospel of Matthew, not realizing who Luke was speaking to pre-trib, not realizing that Mark was the seals and the mid-trib great multitude rapture. Matthew is the seven years of trumpets, and when the Lord returns, when he comes to them post-trib. That's why everybody has missed the 14 years and above and only believe in seven years. This is the revelation of the end of days in the open books. It's been happening here for six years. So this is the was caught up. We've shared it many times. It's the one from uh, Revelation chapter 12, verse 5. Everybody loves to go to it because they think that's the rapture. Well, they're right. <laughs> it is the rapture that everybody thinks about. But it's not the one that they're thinking about, which is the pre-trib rapture. All right? The pre-trib rapture happens before all those things in Revelation 12 from verse 2 all the way to verse 5. Verse 5 is the was caught up when the Lord comes on heavenly Mount Zion. Okay? And then you come down, and then he says in uh, verse 14, Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you. So the first one was a taking, the second one was a taking, and the third one is him coming. I will not be burdensome to you. Okay? So he's talking to Judah here. A taking, a taking, and a return. Now, why am I showing you this? Because it's the foundation to the understanding of what Luke is saying in order. And you realize that there's a pre, a mid, and a post, which is Luke, Mark, and Matthew. And it's all the understanding of the differences in the Gospels. They're all prophecy. So now let's go to what Luke says in Luke in order. 
And we're going to cover in Luke chapter 1 and Luke chapter 2, it's the events that will take place in the portion that Paul called above. It's the above before the 14 years begins. We've been able to reveal here in this ministry that those that that portion of time called above is a period of 50 days. It's from the pre-trib escape and to 50 days later, which is true Pentecost. So from true Feast of Weeks to true Pentecost, then the 14 years of tribulation will begin. And it's something we've been teaching on a lot lately and really, really breaking down. So let's see what Luke 1 and 2 tell us about events that will take place within the, the prophetic typologies that we can see from what we've understood happen in the 50 days that come first. So what we see in Luke chapter 1, verse 1, he says, For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us. Do you know what he's saying here? He's saying Mark and Matthew have, have given us things. He's in the Synoptic Gospels. There's been a declaration of these things. But, and, and we believe them because they're all true. He says, but I know more. And I'm going to lay it out for you. That's what he's going to tell us. Even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. Remember, Luke wasn't there. Luke is afterwards. And then in verse 3, here's what he says. This is, this is the, the, the key. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus. What? Having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first. See, from the beginning. Everything in order. Well, what does that mean? That thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. Well, what, what things are is he instructing about? The certainty of them. And what is it that that so to be understood that he had perfect understanding of and that he knew it from the beginning and he's got it all in order? What what is it? Well, how this came about is through the revelation of, re of realizing pre, mid, and post over a period 14 years and above was the truth of the end of days. It all started to open up. And this happened a few years ago. When you go to Luke chapter 5, you see the story now of him talking to the disciples. They were there with the ships. Well, if you go to Mark chapter 1, look what happens. In Mark chapter 1, there's your beginning. And we see John who prepared the place in the wilderness. And we see Jesus coming. The baptism of Jesus goes out into the wilderness. And what does he do in Mark chapter 1? It's the same story now that you read in Luke chapter 5. So Luke doesn't really begin his story of this story of Jesus, if you will, until chapter 5 in the same context. Oh, sure, you could say in the is, he's laying out more details of this, plus the, the birth of John, plus the birth of Jesus, and so forth. But there's more going on. And you're going to see that there's more going on. You're going to see that, that Mark's gospel and how it starts is actually also a prophetic picture of the beginning of the 40 days when he comes as the Son of Man. You got to remember, we're looking through the scriptures we're looking through into the prophetic taking the is understanding there's an is to come revealed in it we're not making it up it is all laid out but you have to learn how to understand the pre mid and post in the differences in the gospels and i always tell people at the beginning of videos to go watch the first vid four, four videos in this intro end time series right here you can also go to ministryrevealed.com and go to the page uh, in the menu box called Intro and watch uh, and watch the first four videos from there, and you'll begin to understand what it's all talking about. All right? So you can see how Luke chapter 5 and Mark chapter 1 is really where that story begins. Okay? <laughs> Excuse me. In Luke chapter 5. Not Mark chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. 
So now when we go back to Luke chapter one, we're looking for this, this picture of the beginning, the, this above 14 years. And what's the story really get into about here? It's about John and the birth of John is coming and Jesus will be coming soon after. And we see that John is about to be delivered. There we go. In Luke chapter one, verse 57, it says, and here's the other thing you always need to remember. When you're going into these books, you're, you got to remember whether it's Old Testament or New Testament, you're reading things that actually have already happened. In the New Testament, you're reading these things that had already taken place. But within them, there's prophetic insight into the is to come. Does that mean you take every single part and piece of the scripture and, and make it fit into it? No, that's not how it works. There are a little here, as Isaiah 28 says, here a little, there a little. It's not the entire story. You're grasping pieces here and parts there, and you're seeing this picture start to be revealed in front of your eyes that's revealing this picture laid out in the end of days and this mystery as to why Luke said he was knowing and understood everything in order in this instruction that was taking place. Because what kind of instruction is it if it's just about the birth of John, the birth of Jesus, when he's baptized, and when, when Satan deals with him during the 40 days? You see, all of these things happen in a short period of time, with exception from the, the birth of John and Jesus, and then it's many years later in his life. What's, what else is there? What's the instruction in it? Outside of reading it and understanding these things that happened, there's a prophetic mystery in the is to come. And so in verse in Luke 1, 57, it says, now Elizabeth's full time was come that she should be delivered and she brought forth a son. OK, what do we know about John the Baptist, brothers and sisters? I was just on the phone for like almost an hour and a half with our brother, Mark, and um it was funny because we were talking about this and I wasn't planning. I wasn't sure if I was still going to do this video tonight, but we were talking and I thought, oh, you know what? As I was preparing for this, I thought, oh, I'm going to add this into tonight's video because what do you know about John the Baptist? John the Baptist had the Holy Ghost in him before his birth. He had the Holy Ghost in him from before his birth. Do you know that we're told this in Romans? In Romans chapter 8, this group that's part of the above, they're the ones that, just like it said, in Christ Jesus? Hello? In Christ Jesus. What was it in, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2? Those who were in Christ. And what does he say about them here in Romans 8, 1? There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So there's a group of people who are the real true Christians on the earth who are spirit filled in Christ Jesus who will be taken out pre-trib. These are the these are all the pre-tribbers. Everybody who's left wasn't either in Christ and wasn't actually spirit filled. Hello. You know what's sad about that? 90% of people who claim to be in the church are the ones who aren't spirit filled yet. Otherwise, they would be going pre-trib. And we know it's only 10%. We know it's the first fruits of the wheat. So when you follow through, um, we know we, we were sharing on this uh, da, 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 right here. So in Romans 8.14, it says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And it's funny, there was a post in the forum the other day because who are the sons of God? Most people, when, when you think um, in, in the was, in creation, the sons of God were, were fallen angels. Yikes, right? But obviously not all, not all of them were fallen angels. Not all of them fell, which means what? There's a people in the first creation group that didn't fall, that are connected in this typology. They're the sons of God. Who are these people on the earth right now? Many of there's people that have passed too, but we're talking about end of days tribulation, like the beginning of tribulation that will begin with the escape of the bride of Christ. They're the ones who are spirit filled in Christ. They are called the sons of God. 
For you have not received a, a, a spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption where we, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, that's the father, comma, and, meaning that they're together, but they're separate beings, joint heirs with Christ. Are you going to try and tell me you're a joint heir with God the Father? You can't be. You're one of his heirs, making you a joint heir with Christ. If so, be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Now, we've done a teaching on this because there's, there's the is that we're still living in, meaning all those who have died in Christ, spirit-filled, have suffered with them in different ways. Are there people that have been beheaded on this earth for, for their testimony of Christ and killed? Yes, there have been many from Christ until the time of the pre-trib. Are there others that suffer in different ways with ridicule and people coming against them and, and not wanting to go out and drink and party because they, they want to keep themselves right with the Lord. And so, so they're, do, they're, they're avoiding these things because they're spirit-filled. Is there that type of suffering which, which relates to all of these in Christ spirit-filled pre-trib people that are sons of God? Yes. But we've also taught that in the prophetic, there's a group from among them that are also being chosen and prepared to remain because they will be the spirit-filled ones who will bring it about all again as the original spirit-filled ones when the Holy Ghost came the first time, okay? So all the spirit-filled ones are being taken with the exception of the remnant worker group that we teach about an, a lot here on the, on the ministry. And in fact, that's what a lot of the last video was about as well. So these are all the in Christ spirit-filled uh, joint heirs with Christ, sons of God that have either suffered in this life uh, being in Christ, spirit-filled, and uh, also relates to an is-to-come portion that will remain with him for 40 days when he comes as, as, the, as the son of man prophet as Jonah was and will remain to work during seals as that group who, in the first place, received the initial Holy Ghost, okay? Now, what do we know about this group? Well, they're predestined, weren't they? They're predestined, right? Where does it talk about? 30, right? Here it is right here, starting in verse 20, uh, Romans 8, 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. You see, there's a group here on the earth that is predestinated. They're the ones in Christ spirit filled. They're the sons of God, not the fallen sons of God that happened, but a, a typology in the flesh of the ones that never did. They're the ones spirit filled who were predestined during these 2000 years to come to Christ, to be spirit filled, to spread the word now the issue is nobody really knows who they are nobody can say everybody that comes to christ is predestinated not every decision you do and everything's predestinated no that's not it at all but god knew and had a predestinated group throughout the 2000 years that would come that would be spirit filled to bring the spirit and salvation to others so there is a predestinated group but there are only the ones who are in Christ, spirit-filled. I didn't say that. We're reading it right here. He called them. He justified them. He glorified them. And they were all predestinated. And who are they? They're the ones in Christ, spirit-filled. Okay? That's who this group is. That's who this group is. John was what? Spirit-filled from the beginning, wasn't he? John was spirit-filled from the beginning. Who is now the picture reading that from Romans 8? Who is the spirit-filled group from the beginning? If he foreknew them from the beginning, 
They were predestined as sons of God from the beginning. Who was part of that group in the beginning that didn't fall? The spirit-filled group. You see? And what was John? John is a picture of that spirit-filled group. And so what do we see? Now what we're seeing is this is now a picture of that above 14 years. That portion that I said that is 50 days that events, many events will happen in those 50 days. But we're only going to cover the key ones that relate to the picture that we're given here in Luke 1 and in Luke 2. So we see that John was born and it came to pass that on the eighth day they came to circumcise him. So we have the birth of John. So the birth of John is the picture of the beginning of those 50 days of that above portion. And what did it say about that time at the above portion? It said that those were in Christ's spirit filled, right? We're now what? In the third heaven. What do we know happens? And again, I don't want to go into every detail because this can go hours long. But what happens is we know that in this story of the above, this is a picture of the Gentile bride. And in this picture of the Gentile bride, it's a picture of, of Leah, right? Who, whose name means weary, like those who are in Christ's spirit filled. Now they're just, they're weary, just searching and seeking. And Lord, when will you take us out of here? Which again, is another conversation that happens, I think, in Romans 8 or 9, I think in 9, right? That we're calling out, Abba, Father, and and, and please, that, that the earth is groaning as we are within ourselves because we just want to be with them. It's the picture of the Leah pre-trib Gentile bride. And what happens during the seven days before the eighth day? A wedding. So, there's the pre-trib taken out during these eight days, okay, from his birth. There's a seven-day wedding. And when the seven-day wedding is over, we know the Lord is returning after seven on that sometime in the eighth day, which is a picture here of this group now. So you've got John, those that were like John, spirit-filled at, at his birth, being the pre-trib group taken out. Those who are spirit-filled, predestinated, right? Co-heirs, joint heirs. But we've got another group now that is like a picture of John the Baptist at his circumcision, like John still remaining. That's because there is a remnant group of workers that we talk about in the last video, and we've been sharing for many years now, that's connected to Luke 24, to the church of Smyrna, um, to Priscilla and Aquila, it, it's it's in so many different places that we've broken it down. So we know that while this wedding is taking place in heaven, this group of remnant, you could say remnant bride, but this remnant group that was chosen by the Lord to remain to serve him, he is pre-told he's coming back after the wedding, when he returns from the wedding, as he said in Luke 12. That when he returns from the wedding and knocks for them to be ready. So now here we see it's the first group is the, the pre-trib group is taken. A remnant group who is still a John group is now staying spirit filled and they're waiting for the Lord to return on the eighth day. And this is what we're seeing. And then you see that John's dad, his, his mouth was opened, his tongue was loose, and he can now speak. And listen to what he says. When we come down into Luke 1, verse 68, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited. Past tense. He is now visited and redeemed his people. You following? Are you seeing that now? He's now come and he's ransomed his people. He has visited and he has redeemed his people. And has raised up a horn of salvation. For us in the house of his servant David. And as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all them, of, of all that hate us. You see, now what's happening? So there's a group that's been taken out and has been saved from their enemies because why? 
Well, that first group, that pre-trib Gentile bride, that Leah, that above 14 years group, gone to the third heaven, they were never to experience tribulation in the end of days tribulation. That's how, this is one of the reasons you know that a pre-trib happens first. First of all, if it was just World War III, nobody would know that, that the end of days has actually begun. Otherwise, you could have said that about World War III. I mean, uh, World War II. Don't you think millions thought it was, it was the end of days in World War II? Absolutely, they were. But it wasn't. World War III would just be the same if there was no pre-trib group. So why is there a pre-trib that happens first? Because all of those who are spirit-filled in Christ are not meant for tribulation. There is no condemnation in the Gospel of Luke to this group ever. Their portion was not tribulation. There was no wrath for this group. So they couldn't be here during this time. So who are the ones that are taken out? The only ones that remain. Everybody else has died, you know, in Christ, spirit-filled over the last 2,000 years. These were the final ones that remain. And then he chose a group to remain, like he says here, and raise the horn of salvation for us unto his, ser uh, unto his house of, the servant, uh, of his servant David. Okay? He's talking about John the Baptist. Well, what do we know about John the Baptist? There is a remnant group, spirit-filled like John the Baptist, that remains. And what do we know about this group? What ends up happening to John the Baptist? He ends up putting his neck on the line, doesn't he? John ends up being beheaded. And what do we know about this when we talk about, you know, Priscilla and Aquila? We talk about this with Priscilla and Aquila in Romans 16. Why Romans? See, because it's Romans. It's this remnant group who they're a picture of and those who are in their homes. And it says, for they have laid their own necks down. For who? For all the churches of the Gentiles. So what are they doing? They're going to be putting their necks on the line during seals to bring in the house, uh, uh, the churches of the Gentiles, which is to the end of seals. They're helping bring in the great multitude rapture, and they're putting their necks on the line exactly as John the Baptist did, was beheaded. We see this also in, in the church of Smyrna. We see the same thing with Smyrna that, some of them are going to be put to death, right? But they're not going to be, you know, but don't let anybody take a crown of life. I, I will give you, sorry, a crown of life. And you won't be hurt by the second death. We know that they take part in the resurrection to live to reign with the, with the Lord for a thousand years. That's their reward for their service is to reign with him for a thousand years. Whereas the rest of them, it was to go and... um. Uh, was to go to the third heaven and to be with them there. This is for the remnant group. So we've got the remnant group as the uh, uh, the, the pre-trib group as his birth. We got the remnant group as, as John's eighth day, the circumcision. Now this group being raised for the salvation for others. That group was saved from all the hate of all the enemies that was coming. And everything's now about to begin. Okay, now what is he going to do? He's going to be the one to prepare the way. Okay, now he's going to be the one to prepare the way. So is it only going to be one person in the end of days who's going to do all the preparing of the way for the great multitude rapture, which when the when the tribulation begins, when the pre-trib happens, it's going to be the time of the greatest revival in all of human history. Do you think one guy is going to prepare that way? No. It's going to be this remnant worker portion, which I believe, and I've shared before, and I'll share in an upcoming video. I'll do the last chapter of Luke, Mark, and Matthew in another upcoming video and break that down to show why I believe it's two sets of 12,000 as this remnant worker group. A lot of people have been asking me that again lately because some believe it's two sets of 144,000. I personally don't believe it is, and I'm going to show even more detail that reveal in the Gospels that it's only two sets. So. But so this group that prepares isn't just a singular John, in this case, in the end of days. It's a group of people from this remnant bride worker group that remain to serve him, that will be with him in the 40 days and then work to the end of seals. 
That's what we're seeing here. This picture of the beginning of the 50 days, the preacher of escape, John as, as the remnant worker portion of those who are spirit-filled like John, and they remain, they're called, they're, they're going to prepare the way for this great multitude rapture group that's going to come. This is what's taking place. This is the prophetic picture in Luke chapter 1. Now we go to Luke chapter 2. What happens on this eighth day? What happens on this eighth day when the Lord comes? Okay? This is interesting. This is a little side note. just kind of caught my attention. Because I've been talking about how um, when the 50 days begins, when the pre-trib happens, we know that there's an attack that begins the 50 days and there's an attack after the 50 days. And the first attack is going to come on Syria, I mean, on um, uh, by Iran. Most people already know this. And it's going to happen against um, Haifa and Tel Aviv that will be destroyed. It'll be a, 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 a Middle East war will break out. And everybody's saying, oh, this is already happening. No, it isn't. It, this is preparation for the world to wake up, but especially the Jewish people, for them to wake up and to cry out, to repent, and to turn back to the, to, to, to the Lord, right? To turn to God and, and to beg for forgiveness, to, to get rid of their puffed egos that they have, right? They're stiff necked that the scriptures tell us. But what do we know about that attack that happens during the seven day wedding that's in heaven? We know an attack happens. I believe that that attack is only gonna last seven days and that Middle East war that will break out from that when it's not just Israel and, and these guys, but when it's uh, uh, um, uh, Haifa and Tel Aviv destroyed, I believe it's only going to last seven days. And I mentioned it before. So it's interesting when we come to this eighth day that at the time of the birth of Christ, going from John being the first of the 50 days to the eighth day, now here we are at the eighth day, and we come to Luke chapter 2. It would appear that maybe this is where a decree is made. There might be a decree given by somebody, maybe the modern day Cyrus, you know, uh, over the whole world. This talks about to be taxed, but we know that this taxing is actually um, an enrollment or uh, uh, what do they call it? an enumeration, right? Not specifically a tax, but to be counted, to be numbered. So that could be this decree. And maybe that's what's going to happen uh, right after the seven days of that battle. Uh, a decree is going out on the eighth day. Okay, here we go. And then what do we see? So now remember, we're at, we're at the eighth day. We're still in that eighth day in the typology. And what do we see? We see the birth of Christ. And the birth of Christ, we have a picture of what? 40 days. We have the eighth day of his circumcision, um, his mother that uh, remains uh, uh, in the purification uh, portion. And we have a picture of 40 days from the birth of Christ. So we had seven days to the eighth, and then from on the eighth day begins the 40 days. So you have a total of what was that? Uh, uh, 47 days, okay? Because day one of 40 started on the eighth day as well. So you got a total of about 47 days in chapter one to chapter two. And this 40 days is a picture of Jesus's birth, which is a picture of the coming of the Lord for 40 days in the is to come. How do we know he's coming for 40 days? We have shown it everywhere. But let me give you a couple of examples. In Luke chapter 2, uh, sorry, chapter 11, this is something that has thrown the world of church off for a long time because when you go into the synoptic gospels of Luke, Mark, Matthew, this is something that people that study the scriptures will always point to and question. And this is what a lot of Muslims come to and say, ah, see, the scriptures, they're, they're so contradictory. They're just written by men. Well, there's no way around this. There's no way for somebody to really fully explain it when they read this. Because starting in Luke eleven twenty nine, 29, it says, uh, partway through this evil generation seeks a sign. There shall be no sign given it, but the sign of Jonah, the prophet. For as Jonah was a sign... Unto the Ninevites, show, so shall also the Son of Man be to this generation. When you read this, this generation, he was talking prophetically about the final generation. And you'll see that all throughout the New Testament. This did not happen yet. People will try to tell you that at the resurrection, 
Jesus fulfilled this for 40 days. No, he didn't. He didn't go around for 40 days warning like Nineveh, warning like Jonah did. But do you know in the end of days, in Luke 21, which is Luke's discourse, it's the picture of the 40 days of the Son of Man. And it begins from verse 12. This is when the tribulation of the 14 years starts, when it goes nation against nation. That'll be when World War III breaks out at the end of 50 days, the following day. But he says only in Luke, in 21 verse 12, but before all these. This but before is the beginning of the 40 days of the Son of Man. And look what's happening in these 40 days of the Son of Man. In Luke 21, verse 20, And when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which be in the midst depart out of it, and let not, and let not them that are in the countries enter here into. <clears throat> For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written might be fulfilled. How long is it going to go? Well, look at what it says. Verse 24, it says, um, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and they shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Remember Priscilla and Aquila? They're putting their necks down. They're putting their necks on the line for the churches of the Gentiles. That's because it's going to the end of seals, which is in the seventh year at the time of the great multitude rapture. Who, so who are Priscilla and Aquila a picture of? John the Baptist, putting their necks on the line. Who are they a picture of? They're a picture of the remnant workers who will put their necks on the line, who are spirit-filled like John the Baptist. And how long are they going to do it till? Well, at least till the end of the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled, which is the end of seals. And what's Jesus doing here as the Son of Man? Jerusalem is being warned about being compassed about and destroyed. Didn't Jesus just say, knowing that Luke 21 is prophecy in the is to come? Knowing that it relates to the 40 days? And Jesus just said he would do as Jonah did? It's not that he's warning Nineveh. He's going to do as Jonah did, not where Jonah did. So what's he going to be doing? He's going to be warning Jerusalem, warning the Jews. Maybe the rest of the world as well. Who knows? He can come and go and however that might work. But he's coming as the prophet Jonah. Which means he's coming for 40 days. And what's the picture of it? It's connected to a connection to his birth. It's connected to, excuse me, it's connected to his birth. So when we've been looking at this prophetically over the years, I believe for the longest time until earlier this year, that the 40 days of the Son of Man when he comes is connected to when he was born. So if we can figure out when Jesus was born, was it really around Christmas or was it really around the true Feast of Weeks or around Feast of Weeks? When, when was Jesus really born? Well, we now know, and we could prove it, and many others have proven it, that Jesus was born on the 15th day of the third month. Okay? Is that true Feast of Weeks? That is the Feast of Weeks now, but prophetically there's more to understand because we're not counting, and I, this is a side note, we're not counting from barley this time. We're counting from wheat. We're counting from the when the winter wheat starts to get harvested. But the first fruits, which is the two loaves that get waved, their, their time isn't until the harvest is complete. And that's important to understand. <clears throat> but the question is, if that's how it is, how is it going to be connected to Luke chapter 2 and his birth? which for the longest time was something we were trying to understand. How is this 40 days telling us in the 50, knowing that within the 50, the Son of Man is here for 40 days, and chapter 2 is the picture of him here for 40 days in the typology, then it's connected to his birth. Until earlier this year, <coughs> in Isaiah 9, that we've gone to many times now since, as I mentioned to you, there's a first affliction that comes that's called the light affliction that starts the 50 days after the pre-trib escape. It will last probably the seven. And then what? Then a decree being made on the eighth day when the son of man comes, things have settled down, right? And now he's warning during his 40 that 
Jerusalem is about to be surrounded and destroyed before it goes nation against nation. When they are destroyed after the 50 days, that will start nation against nation, and it begins with the attack and destruction of Jerusalem. So look at what we see in Isaiah 9.1. There's a vexation. When at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and Naphtali, and, Naphtali, and afterward a more grievous affliction. Okay? So we see that there's a light affliction in two cities and then a big affliction afterwards. Well, this is exactly what we've been teaching. It starts the 50 days at the pre-trib escape and two northern cities, a typology in, in, in Zebulun and Naphtali, which is a typology in the prophetic of Haifa and Tel Aviv. And so after this attack, look at what it says. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They, shall, uh, they that dwell in the land of the shadow of death upon them, the light shined. Who's this light? It's Jesus. It even tells us. Uh, Isaiah 9, verse 6, For unto us a child is born. For unto us is son, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Well, wait a second. This is now a second confirmation that the Son of Man is connected to the time of his birth, just like Luke 2. And when I first saw this earlier this year, I was so excited because it was a confirmation that Luke 2 is prophetic to the 40 days of the Son of Man after the pre-trib escape and the first two attacks in northern Israel, or the first attack on two cities in the north part of Israel. And it's telling us it's connected to his birth. Until we went to Matthew chapter 4. Because in Matthew chapter 4 is where this was fulfilled in the is. Okay? It tells us in uh, Matthew 4, 12 through 15, um, even starting here in, uh, let's start in verse 12. Now, when Jesus had heard that J John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee, leaving Nazareth. He came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast, in the borders of Zebulun and Naphtali. This is what was fulfilled in Isaiah when Christ came the first time. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying the, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by way of the sea, beyond the Jordan and Galilee uh, of the Gentiles. Well, wait a second. This is the fulfillment from the was in the is. We're now able to show it in the is to come, being Haifa and Tel Aviv. And we know it starts the 50 days at the pre-trib escape. But in, in, in Isaiah, it said that those 40 days, it was, telling, it was telling us about the birth of Christ. Just like Luke chapter 2. But this wasn't the birth of Christ. This, is, was, this wasn't when Jesus was born that he fulfilled it. Was it even his birthday? No. Because this was the aha moment a couple days later or a few days later. And I had prayed because that time had passed of the, the, the month this year. And even though it still wasn't the year as we thought it was then, I couldn't understand if it wasn't being connected to Jesus. And the very next day when I had prayed over it, I came back and reread this, and this jumped out at me. Because what did it say? Now, when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison. So this is all about this 40 days of the Son of Man in Luke chapter 2 and in Isaiah 9, believing for the longest time that it was going to be connected to the 40 days of the Son of Man from his birth. From his birth. Which means if we go back from the 15th day of the third month, that the preacher of escape would happen on the eighth day of the third month. And Jesus would show up to begin his 40 days on his birthday, according to Isaiah and according to Luke 2. But it wasn't lining up with everything else that had come to be revealed since or, or prior to this, uh, uh, prior to this revelation, but even before with Luke 2 and Isaiah 9. Because everything seemed to say that it was Jesus' birthday. So if you go back the seven days to the eighth day before, it would be the eighth of, of Savan at True Feast of Weeks, and then Jesus comes on his birthday. But it didn't line up to 
when the actual harvest of wheat was complete, it didn't line up to when the grapes were were harvested and new wine was being was crushed to make new wine. It didn't line up to to Mark's discourse and Matthew's discourse with the day and hour nobody knew, which is Feast of Trumpets, meaning when the 50 days are over, the first attack would happen at the Feast of Trumpets as well. For then to be end of six years of seals would have to be at the Feast of Trumpets because he's coming on the day and hour no one knows in Mark's discourse. It wasn't lining up if it was directly connected to Jesus's birthday. This was the aha moment because we know from the historical records and from scripture that John was not imprisoned for about two months. It was about two months after Jesus shows up and was baptized that John was then imprisoned. And when we when this aha moment hit, it was it was so incredible. It was so revealing, not only as to what the timing was, that then perfectly equaled when winter wheat had been now harvested and the wave loaves with leaven were baked, were baked, but it also equaled 50 days later to when new wine was actually done. It was incredible. But what else did it do? It showed us that where this time is actually going to begin for this first fr fruits group is not a barley count, but a wheat count. And the wheat doesn't begin to get harvested until around Jesus's actual birthday. In our reality, around middle of Savan is when the wheat harvest begins. And it takes about two months. Actually, seven true Sabbaths. You see? So what ended up happening is I now realized that this didn't happen at his birthday as it appeared to allude to in Isaiah and what we were understanding in Luke chapter 2. The, the real answer for us in the end of days was that Jesus didn't show up at his birthday because it was at his birthday when he began to be about 30, right, that he was baptized by John the Baptist. Which means this was about two months later, knowing John was cast into, into prison about two months later, means that Jesus, when he showed up here, was about two months after his birth. And when that happened, click, 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 everything fell into place in the alignment. And now we know, I believe, when the year is right, I believe it's next year, but whatever year it will happen in, it will happen at the true time of the wheat harvest ending, winter wheat harvest ending, <clears throat> and the pre-trib will happen, the seven-day wedding will take place, and Jesus will return to begin his 40 days on the 15th of 15th to the 16th of Av in that year when he returns from the wedding on the eighth day. How do I know? Because it was connected to his birth for 40 days and revealed that the connection was actually not directly at his birth, but two months after it. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And then what do we see in Isaiah 9? Well, then we saw that after this, then you see when Syria comes with the Philistines and destroys Jerusalem. That's the end of the 50 days. Okay? This is all about the above portion. So what did we end up with? We go back into Luke chapter 2. We went from Luke chapter 1, the beginning at his John's birth, for those that were spirit-filled like John from the beginning, who were the predestined, those who were in Christ, spirit-filled. They were all of those things that we read in John 8. They were removed. A remnant group was, remain, was chosen to remain. We know the first attack happens when they're taken out. It would appear that it would, a decree would happen after seven days, sometime on the eighth day. That group that was anointed to remain from, from the bride, that we'll call them the remnant worker bride, they remain. The Lord's now here 
in the picture of his birth on the eighth day, not really on his birth, but we now know it's connected to two months later, which is giving us the time of year, brothers and sisters. And that literal time of year is the literal completion of the winter wheat harvest. And 50 days later is the literal completion of the grape harvest and the new wine. Okay. So this is your picture of the above. But the only thing we saw in here that we covered is the first seven to the eighth. And then at the eighth, the 40 days picture of the son of man who will be here as Jonah was to warn just as he's doing, as we see in Luke's discourse in Luke chapter 21. So it leaves three days. And that's what brings you to Acts chapter one, <clears throat> which is the same prophetic picture. His 40 days come to an end. He's now gone up in the ascension. And these guys who are the remnant workers, the ones who were chosen to remain by the Lord to, to suffer as he has, because they will receive the glorification as Christ did to be resurrected with new bodies and they will rule and reign with them during the millennial reign. You see, the other group never tasted of death and they got to go to the third heaven. This remnant group will be rewarded with the resurrection and new bodies at the end and they will rule and reign with them for a thousand years. So this is that group. So they're told not many days hence, which was three days. This three days brings us to Acts chapter two, of course, which is true Pentecost. True Pentecost is actually the last day of the year before Tishri one. It is Elul 29 is true Pentecost. Why was this all mixed up? Because it wasn't understood that this count this time is from wheat. And in fact, if you go read like we did in, in recent videos, you even see that it's wheat by going to uh, um, read about the corn when the sickle is put to the corn in um, in uh, uh, Deuteronomy 16. OK, that's the pre-trib group. Sickle is put to the corn. Seven Sabbaths. That's it. That's the pre-trib escape. And there you go. When they when this group will will receive in what we call Acts 2.0, when this remnant worker bride group, they've remained for the seven days. <clears throat> they were waiting for the Lord to come and knock. When he knocks, he's going to bring them somewhere, uh, probably translate them, kind of like what happened with um, with Philip. He'll get they'll get translated. He's going to serve them a meal and sit down and eat with them, and then they're going to follow him for forty days. When the 40 days are done, they will have had their understanding opened in so many things by the Lord. He leaves. They go now wait in Jerusalem, wherever that might be this time in Jerusalem. And they're going to wait till the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And from the anointing of the Holy Ghost, they're now going out from Jerusalem. They start right there and bang, they're going out right away. Because the next day is the attack after that 50th day is the attack by Syria from the that that year's end to Tishri 1. I believe this will happen next year. This is Luke in order, and the above portion, which is the seven days, and then on the eighth and the 40 days starting. That's the prophetic picture that he's telling us in this thing that was to be understood about what he was understanding in order. Otherwise, you would read that, and you'd be scratching your head. What, what's he telling us in order that we're supposed to understand? Just that John's birth, Jesus' birth, and then later in their life? It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't line up. Something else is going on. It's prophecy. These differences are always prophecy. These mysteries are prophecy. <clears throat> so the only thing we didn't have in Luke 1 and 2 was those three days. That's the only thing we didn't have. Okay? So it shows this, the, the pre-trib, the seven days, to the eighth day, the 40 days of the Son of Man start, and then we know prophetically, and from the is of what happened, that there were three more days and then the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Now we go to Luke chapter 3. So remember, in relation to 2 Corinthians, we covered the pre that goes at the above, at the start of the above, which is 50 days, we covered now the information in Luke 1 and Luke 2 related to the above and then showed what that three days difference was. Then what happens? 
Well, then there's nothing until the mid-trib great multitude rapture, <laughs> which happens in the seventh year of seals. That we see the Lord coming at the end of the sixth seal, which is the end of the first six years of tribulation. But the great multitude rapture doesn't happen right away. Okay? That great multitude rapture happens sometime in the midst of the seventh year because they, as we've taught on in, in recent videos, they are what's called spring wheat. Even though it's harvested in the fall, when he comes to start the seventh year, he's coming on heavenly Mount Zion. He's not actually, they're not actually being um, observed until the time of the second day of Passover of unleavened bread in the following year. So even though it starts, he, he's coming at the Feast of Trumpets to start the seventh year on the day and hour no one knows, after six years to start the seventh, it's, that's, that's when the harvest is ready, but it's not observed until about six months later on the second day of Passover in unleavened bread. That's called spring wheat. That's the spring wheat harvest. Okay? And so, <clears throat> now what do we know about this? Well, remember, John is the prophetic group that is this remnant worker group a typology of a portion of them. Is there another portion? Yeah, I believe one is a John type and one is the Elijah type. You see, we have this story only of John. And here we are now, we're in Luke chapter three, and you're going to see that this is the prophetic picture towards the end of the first six years of seals when the Lord's seen coming and they're saying, rocks and mountains fall on us and hide us from the wrath. Uh, of the lamb right for the great day of his wrath has come that's the end of the six years of seals and then the seventh year begins and there's no more battles or anything okay in that seventh year and who was here well the remnant worker type who are those as john who were willingly going to be putting their necks on the line for the lord who were what preparing a people in the wilderness Remember what happens in Mark's discourse? In Mark's discourse, it's a picture of the seven years of seals. You saw how in Luke's discourse, it said, but before these things. Look at what it says in Mark's discourse. There's nothing about but before these things. You know where it starts? Nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. This is actually the red horse rider because the white horse rider was the son of man as, as Jonah was for 40 days. This is the red horse rider now being released. That's why it didn't happen during Luke's portion. And Luke's portion said, but before all these. Meaning this, this above 50 day portion that's being spoken about here in Luke, is specifically the 40s, is before nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. This nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom begins at the red horse rider, which is the attack by Syria at the end of 50 days which will be at the to, from the last day of the year to the Feast of Trumpets at the beginning of the 14 years, not in the above portion. But as soon as that above is over, the 14 years begin, nation against nation, and it starts with the destruction of Jerusalem. That's why Marx starts literally like this. Now, <clears throat> when we go back into here, in Luke chapter 3, <clears throat> excuse me, in Luke chapter 3, when you go down into Mark's discourse, we see the abomination of desolation. That abomination of, the, of desolation is the actual mark of the beast. Remember, we're still in the Gentile age during seals. And during the Gentile age, what is it still? It's still for Christ. You know, it's still all Christ and the Lord and everything else. So what's happening? The temple is still within people. The actual physical temple is not being built during seals. Only the foundation will be laid, but the temple won't be built during seals because the temple is still the people that have come to Christ. And that abomination of desolation is all about the mark of the beast that will be placed in the temple like Moses's temple, the temple that is flesh covered, that is covered in skins and portable. That's called the body. <laughs> all right. That's that's our flesh and bone, right? That's during the time of John and them fleeing into the wilderness. 
So John being that remnant worker group who's preparing a people and is the one in the wilderness, he's the one as this group of people will probably be leading people to places in the wilderness and throughout the world into places of protection when they need to flee at the time of the mark of the beast, which is about two and a half years into the tribulation after World War III when the Antichrist gets his power to continue for 42 months to the end of the six, first six years of seals <clears throat> to when the Lord comes on Mount Zion and destroys him. And so what was John doing? John was in the wilderness and he was what? He was the one who prepared a place. He was the one who prepared a place. You see? He's the one preparing a place. Now, John the Baptist, who is the one preparing a place, <clears throat> wants this. If you go into Luke's Mount Transfiguration story, in right here, Transfiguration story, you see nothing about them asking about, I thought Elijah comes first. You, you don't see him respond by saying Elijah did come first. It was John. Why doesn't he do it? Why isn't, why isn't that story spoken about in, uh, in Luke's transfiguration story? Why is there this difference in Luke's, <clears throat> excuse me, this drastic difference? The answer, of course, is that this is when, this is a picture. This is also a prophetic picture of, see, when he comes about an eight days later. This is a prophetic picture of him coming as the 40 days of the Son of Man. So there is no need for a response of, I thought Elijah was coming first, because this is the Elijah group that he's now going to be choosing with him. This is that remnant worker group. Look what happens when you go to Mark, which relates to Luke chapter 3, which is after John has prepared a place in the typology of this remnant worker group, who were helping the people and bringing in this great multitude rapture, taking them to places of, of security and protection when they had to flee into the wilderness and to the mountains in the midst of tribulation when Antichrist got his power. Look what happens in Mark's story of the transfiguration. Listen to what they say <clears throat> in, right here, in Mark 9, verse 11 through 13. And they asked him, saying, why say the scribes that Elias or Elijah must come first? And he answered and told them, uh, Elias verily cometh first and restoreth all things. Now, remember what happens when seals begins? When seals, when the tribulation begins, it begins with not only nation against nation, but even in the above portion. What, what is John and, and the remnant workers like John, what are they to do? They're responsible for bringing about the restoration of all things. And what is the restoration of all things? Bringing fathers back to sons, mothers to daughters, right? Because look what happens in Mark's discourse when the tribulation begins. Look what happens. Verse thir uh, Mark 13, verse 12. Now the brothers shall betray the brother to death, the father, the son, and the children shall rise against their parents. You don't see this in Matthew's discourse because this is only to the end of seals and to the, to the end of the six years of seals because John and the John types are going to be the ones to bring families and restore them for the time of the great multitude rapture. So when you go up here back into nine, we read in there where they're asking, uh, you know, restores all things and how it is written of the son of man that he must suffer many things uh, and be set at naught. But I say unto you that Elias or Elijah is indeed come and they have done unto him whatsoever they listed as it is written of him. So so who is this Elijah that they say must first come? Right. Who is this?
Hopefully that paused everything. I had to change my propane so my garage wouldn't freeze again. All right. So we see that and we understand that Elias or Elijah is, of course, John the Baptist. But now we've got two pictures. We've got an Elijah type and we've got a John type. And what do we know happened to Elijah in the end of days? Uh, uh, sorry, in, in history. Elijah never died. Elijah was taken up in a whirlwind, right? Almost like a rapture, right? Elijah was a rapture type. Who was the other one that was a rapture type? Enoch. Enoch never tasted of death. Enoch is the prophetic pre-trib picture, and Elijah is a prophetic mid-trib picture of the great multitude rapture, okay, of those that will still be alive at that point that go in the rapture. John, who puts his neck on the line, is a picture of those who died and will still be going at the time in the in the pre-trib. They're the ones who have died, and the Elijahs are the types who were alive. So what we're seeing is John is actually a type of Elijah. And in the end of days, we know that there's a John type and an Elijah type. So even though in Luke chapter 3, when we're reading about John who prepared the way, we know that John is also an Elijah type. And what do we have for workers during? Who are the John workers and the Elijah type workers in the end of days? Right? We know that in Luke chapter 2, and I'm going to share this in, uh, sorry, in Luke uh, chapter 24, I'm going to share this in the next video when I do the, the last chapter of the synoptics of Luke, Mark, Matthew. I'm going to go into greater detail of just those those books, kind of like what we're doing in one, two, three, four of Luke, just those chapters. And so what do we see? Well, we know, sorry, that there are two groups. I need my heat to work. <laughs> So, uh, one second, one second. Oh, man, that sucks. All right. Well, maybe I can do it. It won't get too cold. All right. So, what happens is we know that there are two groups. So, I've said it before. I believe that it's not, as I was saying earlier, 144,000 workers and 144,000 workers. I believe it's simply... 24,000 and 144,000, and that's the trumpets workers, okay? This worker group is a picture of John and a picture of Elijah. You see, we also get this understanding when we go into Smyrna that with Smyrna, we know that it says, and some of you they shall cast into prison and that it's going to be some of them put to death, right? So not all of them are going to be put to death. Yet John and his type was put to death, and Elijah wasn't because he was taken. You see? So we've got two worker types, John and Elijah, both spirit-filled, both doing their work for the Lord. One put their neck on the line, one didn't. We have two 12,000 portions in, in the two on the road to Emmaus as the prophetic picture of the 12,000, two, two portions of, of 12,000. Like I said, I'll explain it in the next video. And that's what we're getting this prophetic picture of. So John in himself, we all know, is a picture prophetically of two people because he himself was a prophetic picture of Elijah. So we can see by going into Mark that Elijah or John the Baptist or the two types of them prophetically in the end of days by the end of seals had already come. They had already prepared the place for the people, okay? And then in verse in uh, Luke 3, verse 6, it said, And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Then he says, Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Wasn't that interesting? Isn't this exactly what we were just talking about? Flee from what wrath to come? 
Well, if this is the end of the the sixth year time frame of seals, what do we see about fleeing from the wrath to come? Look at this. Same one, 3709. What is this a picture of? It's a picture of the Lord coming at the end of the sixth year of seals. It says, in, in what does it say? Verse uh, 16, and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath has come. And there we see in, in chapter three, who, who told you to flee from the wrath to come? What is this a picture of? We recently covered it as well. It's in Daniel chapter two. Remember the, the image of Nebuchadnezzar. This image of Nebuchadnezzar, I talked about it in a short, I think, as well. The image of Nebuchadnezzar, look at what it says. Um, in verse 28, Daniel 2, verse 28. But there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets, yep, and makes known to, the, to King Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Okay? So was it also a picture of, of events taking place at his time because he was the head of gold and so forth? Of course. But is it also prophecy? Absolutely. He told us it was. And what was it? Well, we know the, the head and, and the right of gold and then silver and, and thighs and all that stuff. And what do we see? I talked about how the legs, uh, uh, how the toes are the same picture with the 10 toes being the picture of the 10 horns with the Antichrist and those who receive power, right? Those who will receive power one hour with them. And when Jesus comes for this attack, for this destruction against the enemies, at the end of the sixth seal, that wrath that he's talking about, that's exactly what's happening in Revelation 17 at the wrath of the Lamb. It even tells us it's the one of the Lamb. We shared a video on that recently. And what's what are we seeing here? We see in 17 that he destroys the, the ten kings and the Antichrist. Okay? Look at what happens here in Daniel 2. So what do we have? We, we have this prophetic picture of events taking place during seals from the head of gold to the toes. And then Jesus coming at the end of the sixth year of seals for the time of his wrath, like Luke chapter 3 is telling us, when John and the Elijah type who have prepared a place and are putting their necks on the line, and those who aren't because it's only some of them, as, as uh, uh, Smyrna is telling us, who represent that worker group, who are the Priscilla's and Aquila's in the John types putting their necks on the line, this group who remained who were the spirit-filled. <clears throat> and when Jesus comes at the end of the sixth year, which is when he's coming for his wrath, it's the picture of what? When he comes to destroy those 10 kings and the Antichrist, which is the image itself. And what do we see? Thou sawest till that a stone was cut without hands, which stoned the image, uh, which smot the image uh, upon his feet that were of iron and clay and broke it to pieces. And everything came crumbling down like the chaff of the summer threshing floor. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smot the image became a great mountain. This is what everybody misses. <clears throat> and the reason is because they only see seven years. When you realize that it's 14 years, then you'll understand how can he be here on a great mountain, yet he's not feet down on the Mount of Olives. That's because when he's coming at the end of the sixth seal and he's coming to do this stuff, which prophetic, prophetically he said he was coming to do, he's coming on heavenly Mount Zion. He's coming with the place he now has prepared. That he has prepared. That when he left, he said he would return and receive them unto himself. That where he was, they shall be also. He's coming to receive them into what? 2 Corinthians chapter 12. When the second group was caught up and goes to paradise. That is when he comes at the end of the sixth year of seals. And he's on heavenly Mount Zion that became a great mountain that the whole world looked up and they're like, ah, mountains and rocks fall on us, hide us from the wrath of the lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come. And look at the wording that we get here. Remembering 
Revelation 6 that it's the wrath of the Lamb and that it's the ten toes representing the ten horns, which are the ten kings, this is exactly what we see here. Watch this. Da -da -da. Revelation 17, 12. And the ten horns which thou sawest are, the, are ten kings, which have received no power as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb. And the lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and king of kings. Only one uppercase in each. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Okay? There you go. There's your ten toes as the ten horns from Revelation chapter 13. <clears throat> Excuse me. And your beast from the one who got the authority over all of that stuff and became what? The image itself. This is when Antichrist, the beast, is killed at the end of the sixth year of seals, which is the end of his 42 months. So you see, that's why we say here in 11, the beast that was, because this is when he's here for 42 months in the second half of seals, and is not, because when the lamb comes at the end of the sixth seal, he ends his 42-month reign, so he is not during that time of the, the last year of seals and the first half of trumpets. And then he what? Is. He shall be. Right? It says, then he shall be. So what does that mean? What happens when he shall be? It's when he comes at mid-trumpets, when he's resurrected, when he's brought back from the grave, because when Satan is cast down and the pit is open, <coughs> excuse me, Antichrist comes back. That's what the story is here. This is the one from when he was, the Lord destroys him, then he won't be. And when he comes back, it's when it's the perdition time, which is mid-trumpets. So you're seeing now, and remembering what we just read in Daniel 2, we see that he prepared the place in the wilderness. You know, who told you to, to flee from the wrath that's coming, which, of course, is the wrath of the Lamb. Uh, listen to what it says here. Watch this. In Luke 3, 17, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and will gather the wheat into his grainer, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. Sound familiar? Weren't we just reading from Daniel chapter 2 and the destruction of the beast and the ten toes and... The, the 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 chaff of the wheat. What's he doing? He's gathering in his wheat. Hello. He's going to then gather in his wheat. And what do we know about this gathering of wheat? You got it. It's the spring wheat. He's coming at the time of Feast of Trumpets after six years. On the day and hour, no one knows, just like Mark's discourse says. By the way, that's why you don't see it in Luke's. And... When he comes in this picture of the end of six years, he's going to destroy the enemy. These people know that they're fleeing from the wrath to come. Why? Because all flesh are going to see this coming. That's why they're all screaming out. And then what happens? He's going to gather in, see, and will gather the wheat. Because when he comes, it's going to be the time of the spring wheat harvest. But it's not observed until Passover the following year. And what do we see? Into his granier in the chaff, he shall burn unquenchable. I'm telling you guys, are you seeing what's going on here? This is a picture of the end of the six years and into that seventh year of seals when he comes at the time of his wrath, destroys his enemies destroys the ten kings and the beast and the image that, that was the image of the beast and the mark of the beast and the time of the great multitude rapture. And who was the one that prepared them and brought them in? Look at what it says about John. John had been what? That he, John, uh, uh, that he shut up John in prison, okay? And added yet this above all, that he shut up John in prison. John was what? John was imprisoned and beheaded. Okay? 
imprisoned and put to death. Do you know, I shared it in the previous video, that the worker group, there's only one worker group, and I showed it and connected it from Old Testament to New Testament to the is to come of prophecy. <clears throat> Do you know that only Luke's group? Do you know Luke's group is the only one that says prison and killed? Only Luke's group. Why? Because they're the prophetic picture of John, the spirit-filled remnant group who remains. And some of them are the Elijah types that won't die. Another group is the John types that will be put into prison and die. Just like the Priscilla's and the Aquila's putting their necks on the line. And just like the Smyrna group, which is a picture of the beginning of the 40 days. And this group with the Lord, who is put into prison, some of them, and some of them will be killed. It's all in Luke in order. It's absolutely incredible to be able to see, <coughs> excuse me, and to understand these things. Look what else we see here. Watch this. Um, in Luke 3, verse 8. Now, you got to remember, before the great multitude rapture comes in, what do we know happens in Revelation chapter 7? So if this is the prophetic picture, who told you to hide from the wrath to come? Well, we know that this is the end of the sixth seal, right? The end of the sixth seal and the end of the sixth year. He's coming to bring his wrath. But when this also happens, <laughs> and we go now into Revelation 7, who does he seal first? He seals the 144,000 before the great multitude rapture. And so let's go into verse 8. There's end of the sixth seal, the sixth year. And it says, bring forth, therefore, fruits worthy of repentance. And begin not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham, our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to rise up children unto Abraham. But now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, which bringeth forth, uh, which bringeth not forth good fruit, is hewed down and cast into the fire. So what is he saying now? He's talking to the 144,000. The 144,000 are the picture of the of the grapes, of the grape harvest. Well, when does that happen? Lo and behold, at the time of, of uh, um, trumpets, right? The 29th of Elul is true Pentecost. When it's time of the grapes, the time of the fruit from the trees. And what's it also a, prof a prophetic picture of? The final group. So you had barley, which was Jesus. You had wheat, which was the pre-trib, and the other wheat, which is the mid-trib. And then you've got the grapes, right? The fruit, which relates to the Judah portion. And they have to go out and produce good fruit. Look at this. We see it in John 15. In fact, look at what it says in John 14. If you're newer to the channel, John's gospel stands alone. So you've got the synoptic gospels and John stands on his own. And John has 21 chapters. It's a prophetic picture of the end of days. And chapter 8 through 21 are the final 14 years. So if you go to chapter 14, you're going to see this prophetic typology, which is what? Jesus is coming at the end of the 6th, which would be the 13th, okay? There's the beginning, okay? He's coming as the light of the world, okay? Remember what he says? Remember what he said in, um, in uh, 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 Isaiah 9? He's the light of the world, right? He's coming as the light to shine in the darkness to those that see a light. There it is. So there's your prophetic picture of the, the end of days beginning. And when you come to 13, it's like the end of the sixth year of seals. So there's your beginning of the 14 years or the, sorry, not 14 years, the beginning of your seventh year of seals. OK, the other seven is the preparation for the bride. And we know he's coming with what? He's coming on heavenly Mount Zion, the mountain, right? The stone cut, right? That became a great mountain. He's coming with paradise, as I told you earlier, which is that place prepared. 
So John prepared a people in the wilderness and Jesus is coming with the place that he had prepared for them. So now this is a picture of that seventh year of seals. And then what happens? Then you go to the beginning of trumpets. And when you go to the beginning of trumpets, look what Jesus says. I am the true vine. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he, per he, he uh, pruneth it or purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Isn't that exactly what he said? And when did he say it? He said it after the picture of his, the conversation of his, uh, um, his wrath, right? Which is the end of the sixth year of the of seals. Now he's talking like this beginning time frame of the seventh year of seals, where he's telling them that they have to bring forth worthy fruit, or he'll cut them down. And then what do we see? Then we see him talking about the wheat that he's going to be now gathering in. <laughs> it's a direct picture of the end of the sixth seal, the beginning of the seventh chapter with, with the 144,000 who are to go out and produce fruit. And then you have the great multitude rapture, the spring wheat. <laughs> I told you guys, it's so awesome. When you could follow and see these things, it just blows your mind. And it's this mystery that was hidden in Luke about his understanding of knowing these things in order. And now look what happens. Now we come to Luke chapter 4. What happens in Luke chapter 4? Well, going back to going back to uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we know that then what? Then he comes, then he says the third time, I am coming to you. Okay? So now when he's coming the third time, the whole world's going to see him and everything else. And when does he come? At the 14th year. But when he comes at the 14th year, who was given power? Listen to what it says. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So when you read these things in Mark's gospel at the beginning, it's like everything is all there in the is that took place. But when you see it in Luke, he's revealing you these things in order in these chapters that played out over all of these years from the birth of John till this time of Christ as a prophetic picture revealing insights into the is to come for us. And look at what it says in Luke 4, verse 2, being 40 days tempted of the devil. So now you see Satan's here. Well, guess what? If you go to Revelation chapter 12, Look at what it reads. <clears throat> Here's your great multitude rapture was caught up after what? In verse 12, in Revelation 12, verse 5, and she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. See, this was Jesus coming at the end of the sixth seal on heavenly Mount Zion in the clouds, like Luke's disc, uh, like Mark's discourse says, and her child was, was caught up. Who is the was caught up in 2 Corinthians chapter 12? The great multitude rapture, the second one. The ones that go to paradise. You see? And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and so now what happens? Now you've got the first half of trumpets. Seals are over. And you've got the first half of trumpets, which is the 1260 days. What's happening during these 1260 days? Now the Lord is on heavenly Mount Zion. Now the temple is getting rebuilt in the, at the start of the trumpets tribulation. The first three and a half years, the 1260 days of trumpets is when the city and the streets and the temple get rebuilt, not by Antichrist. They will not be built by, it will not be built by Antichrist. The Lord will be here, the modern day Zerubbabel, and the temple will be rebuilt on the foundation that was laid during seals. And so when this time is up and the 1260 days are over, <clears throat> we're now at mid trumpets. You're now at a point where you're 10 and a half years approximately into the tribulation. Seven years of seals total. And 
three and a half years approximately of trumpets. So you're in the 11th year, 10 and a half years in approximately total. And, <clears throat> excuse me, the temple has now been completed. What happens when the temple is completed? Satan is cast down. Satan is cast down. When does Satan get cast down? We see that at the fifth trumpet, I saw a star fall from heaven, giving it the key to the bottomless pit. And what happens when the pit is open? <coughs> Excuse me. What happens when the pit is opened? Okay. When the bottomless pit is opened, Revelation 11, we see when the pit was opened right here. See? Uh, and when they had finished the, uh, and when they had finished their testimony, the beast ascendeth out of the bottomless pit. Remember the beast was killed at the end of the sixth year of seals after his 42 months. Then he was not. And now he is. Why? Because he's coming out of the bottomless pit. He's going to make war against them. You see how long, what does it say? Shall make war against them and kill them. Most people have no clue how long this war is going to last. It's not a one day or one week war or anything like that. <clears throat> this war against the two witnesses when the pit is open and Antichrist comes back and because Satan has been cast down and he has lost his battle with Michael and his angels and now Satan and his angels are cast down and the pit is open and Antichrist comes back and everything that comes out of the pit. This war and this that happens at, at, the, uh, at the midpoint of trumpets 10 and a half years in, in the 11th year, after the temple had been complete, this is now Matthew 24 and the abomination of desolation. When he's now going to go stand in the actual temple. Because the flesh portion temple of Antichrist the first time is over. Okay? The, the Gentile age is over. Trumpets is the time for Judah. <laughs> this war lasts for two and a half years. And we know that it lasts for two and a half years because Daniel 12 tells us. It says, uh, when he says, how long, right? He says, how long shall this last? That it shall be for time, times, and a half. There's no end here, so this means one, two, plus a half. Till they have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. So if we go back to Revelation chapter 10, when is it finished? It says, and in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound. So at the beginning of the seventh trumpet, which is the seventh year of trumpets, which is the beginning of the 14th year of tribulation, it says what? The mystery of God should be finished. It's over because they'll see him now coming feet down on the Mount of Olives from lightning from one end unto the other for the whole world to see in power and authority. And this battle that will take place at that point is what we're seeing this, this event of Luke chapter 4. So who was in power from the three and a half year point or ten and a half years into tribulation for those tw uh, uh, 1260 days? The Lord was here. The temple was being rebuilt. Right? He was on Zion. The great multitude had, hap had happened. The, the temple was being rebuilt. And then Satan lost, was cast down. There's war against the two witnesses, right? There's this battle. The Lord's not, the Lord, the, the, everything's not the same. It's all changed now because Satan, his angel has been cast down and the pit has been opened. So Messiah is cut off. And what happens? Antichrist and Satan, they all go into the temple, declare himself God. And what happens? Well, we just saw that Satan and Antichrist, they now have the power there for two and a half years. That means the battle in Revelation chapter 11 that takes place against the two witnesses will last for two and a half years before they're killed at the end of the sixth trumpet, just like it says. That sixth trumpet is the second woe. It began at the first woe and it ends at the end of the second woe. That's a total of two and a half years leaving one year left of tribulation, which is the 14th year. So when Jesus returns and he comes feet down on the Mount of Olives, when the seventh angel begins to sound, 
And it's right at the beginning. Watch this. I can prove it to you. Right at the beginning of the 14th year. Listen to what it says in Matthew 24. <clears throat> in Matthew 24, see, there's the abomination. This is, this is when the 1260 days are up. Okay, this is the fleeing into the wilderness. And in, in Revelation chapter 12, it says time and times and half a time. That's because those who are going to be fleeing into the wilderness are this group here in the abomination of desolation. They're fleeing right before this abomination of desolation on wings of an eagle. And they're going to be safe until the end of the 14th year. But Satan's time is only going to be two and a half of the final three and a half years. Because the final 14th year, when the Lord returns feet down on the Mount of Olives, he's coming. Listen to what it says. Immediately, immediately after the tribulation of those days. What's immediately after the tribulation of those days? It was the two and a half years that Satan had. The two and a half years when the pit was open, Satan cast down Antichrist, the declaration of being God and standing in the temple that was completed during the first half of trumpets. So now what happens? Satan was here for two and a half years. So when Jesus returns feet down on the Mount of Olives, who had control? Who was given authority over everything for those two and a half years? Satan. Satan with the Antichrist and false prophet again, right? So when we go back to Luke chapter 4, and we know that this is a prophetic picture of him coming at the end at the 14th year, who was in control? Well, let's see what it says. Let's start in Luke chapter 4, verse 4. Let's look at the prophetic picture. And Jesus answered him saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Do you know what this means? He was showing him the kingdoms of the world in a future moment in, of time. That's what it means. This was prophetic. He was showing him the kingdoms of the world in the future. And now prophetically in the future, he's there and he's showing them all the kingdoms of the world at that time. And listen to what happens. Verse 6. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give to thee and the glory of them. Listen to this. For that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it. If thou therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. You see that? There was a moment in time when the devil, when Satan is showing Jesus that all of this was given to him. It's all mine. And if you'll bow down to me, I'll give it to you. <laughs> you see? But Satan only gets two and a half years. Prophecy revealed that. And Jesus answered, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written that thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. What gets rebuilt in the midst of trumpets when Satan is then cast down? The temple. So where is he going to take him to? He's going to take him at that moment in time, and he's going to take him to the temple. You see? It's an exact picture. <laughs> and then what happens? After Satan has tempted Jesus, when he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives, listen to what it says, verse 13, the prophetic picture. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, <clears throat> he departed from him for a season. Well, wouldn't you know it, what happens in Revelation chapter 20? Revelation chapter 20, verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is called the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no longer till the thousand years were, were fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed 
a little season. <laughs> oh, man. Are you seeing the pictures, guys? <clears throat> Are you seeing the picture? Pre-trib, 40 days of the Son of Man. Mid-trib, post-trib. And look what happens when it's all over. 14, 4, Luke 4, 14, and 15. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him through all the region round about, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. How awesome is that? How awesome is that? This is now a prophetic picture. Satan is bound. He's destroyed the enemy. And now he's going round about. Everybody is hearing about this is really Jesus. Excuse me. This is really the Lord. This is our Lord and Savior Jesus. Like the last days, end of days. And he's being glorified of all well then listen to how it ends uh luke 4 verse 8 so remember what this was this is a picture of the final 14th year of tribulation okay so we just went through it and now we're coming into that picture which is like that that end picture time of the final 14th year satan is bound he's destroyed the enemies and, and now there's, there's a glory going out about him. Okay? You're coming to the end. Is the picture of the end of the 14th year of tribulation. Listen to what it says. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Starting in Luke 4, verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and the recovering of sight to the blind. To set at liberty them that are bruised. Okay? And to set at liberty them that are bruised. To preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And to close the book. Many of you have probably heard this teaching even from other pastors. He never finished the rest of that saying, right? He closed the book. Saying, this has now been fulfilled this day in your, year, in your ears. Well... What was he telling them? Uh, what is it? Isaiah 61. What is it? Listen to what it says. And, uh, uh, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of his... And the day of the vengeance of our God to comfort them that mourn. What's he doing? This day of the Lord, this, this year of his vengeance has now been accomplished. And what is he doing? He's now declaring the Jubilee. Remember where we are. He has brought this vengeance now. He has destroyed the enemy. He's now about to, he's declaring that he's about to set the captives free, which means he is, we just saw he's already destroyed, like bound Satan for the thousand years. In the prophetic picture. And so now if we go to Leviticus chapter 25, we see that what he's declaring is the Jubilee. And thou shalt number seven Sabbaths, seven times seven years, 49 years. Then shall thou cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound. Well, look at what it is. It's like the seven, 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 seven. Then you had the seven years to prepare the bride, the seven years for seals. The seven years for trumpets, this final seventh year is actually the 49th year in a jubilee cycle. And what's he declaring in chapter four? He's literally declaring that the jubilee is now at hand. Listen to what it says. Leviticus 25.10, and you shall hallow the 50th year and proclaim liberty through all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you. And you shall return every man to his possession. You will return every man to his family. The Jubilee, right? Okay, so it's it's a releasing of everything. And remember all of those people that in, in Revelation chapter 12, they were taken for time and times and a half a time. They were, I said they were gone till the end of the 14th year. That's because when that final year of destruction against all the enemies and Satan is bound, Jesus is now declaring that the, fort, that, that the Jubilee is at hand. What happens at the Jubilee? 
all of those that flew away on the wings of an eagle till the end of that 14th year, which was the final three and a half years, they're now going to return at the Jubilee year because they're going to be restored all of their lands and their promised millennial reign is going to begin. Listen to this. That's exactly what Jesus was saying. He was literally declaring the Jubilee was now at hand. And when did he declare it? After he defeated Satan, who had declared that everything had been given to him for a period of time. Now he's being, now he's gone and departing for a season. And then he's going to be released for a season, <laughs> but not until the millennial reign is over. And all the glory goes out about, about around Jesus. It's now a picture of the end of the 14th year. He's destroyed the enemies and he's declaring the Jubilee is now at hand. Do you know that when Jesus did this, check it out. From Jesus's birth, when you understand the count and you go to Jesus's birth, we see in the is of what happened, not in the prophetic that we were looking at at Luke in order, but in the is that took place. Jesus in Luke chapter three, it said it was the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. And the history records tell us that the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar was 28 AD. How do we know? Because 29 AD was the 16th year of Tiberius Caesar when he made coins for one of his wife, uh, for his wife. Okay. When we look at it in what took place, it was from the end of 28. So you got to remember, this is going from Feast of Trumpets to Feast of Trumpets. So from this 28 that started here, Feast of Trumpets 2028 through January, right? All the way through spring, summer to the Feast of Trumpets, which begins then right here in 2029 AD. Jesus was making this declaration right here. He was declaring it right here, right in that time frame of 28 AD. Okay. When he, was, when he began to be 30 in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. Tiberius Caesar was 29 AD, was the 16th year of Tiberius Caesar. And there's coins that prove it. So when Jesus was declaring it this year, look at what it was. It was a Jubilee year. He was declaring the Jubilee as we saw in Luke chapter 4. Which means from 29 to 30 AD, from Feast of Trumpets to Feast of Trumpets, Jesus has declared the Jubilee. Well, what happens if you do 49 and the 50th, a Jubilee, all the way through from those years, counting on our calendars? Look at where the final Jubilee is. From 2038 to 2039, look at where it is in our 14 to the 15-year picture. It's the same as this right here. 14 to the 15 year picture, 2038, final Jubilee year. And it's the exact count from the declaration of when Jesus did it in the is, revealing the is to come. Do you know what that Jubilee equals? It means from 2023, Feast of Trumpets, to 2024, Feast of Trumpets. Guess what it is? We're in this final year. That means that Feast of Trumpets 2024, according to the revelation and the understanding, Feast of Trumpets 2024, this green two right here is the beginning of the 14 years. The 50 will be in this final portion of the above. And at Feast of Trumpets 2024, Syria attacks and destroys Jerusalem and nation against nation begins the 14 years. When Jesus returns feet down at the beginning of this 14th year or the seventh year of trumpets, when the trumpet begins to sound, we just saw that in Luke chapter four, who just had authority for two and a half years? Satan did. So that when Jesus returns feet down, what is he going to do? Satan's going to tempt him saying, all this was given to me. He had two and a half years in which to do it. Chaos on the earth destruction and devastation and then there satan is attempting to give it to him if he'll bow down to him and jesus destroys satan 
finds him. He's in the pit for a season, for a thousand years. And then Jesus is praised and glory goes out. He's being glorified and he declares the Jubilee is at hand. Brothers and sisters, I hope and pray this blesses you. I hope and pray this really got your juices flowing and you were able to understand what Luke in order now means. Luke in order, knowing all things from the beginning, having had perfect understanding from the very first in order, was a prophetic mystery of Luke chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4, pre-trib, 40 days of the Son of Man as the white horse rider, mid-trib, great multitude rapture, at the end of the sixth seal, into the seventh year, and his return after the sixth year of trumpets at the end of 13 years, and here for the 14th year, and at the end of the 14th year, having destroyed his enemies, declaring the Jubilee is now at hand. Brothers and sisters, that is the revelation of Luke in order. I pray it blesses you. And for one more shout out to our sister Yolanda, if anybody can share and support our sister, please do so. Again, I pray this blesses you. I did intend it to be a, a shareable short, but there is so much incredible revelation in this. I could not help myself. And I just go where the spirit leads. So I pray this blesses you. It makes sense. Dig into it. Pray over it. Spend time in it. Seek it all out in the scriptures. I've showed you where they are. Go and seek them out and pray over them. And we'll talk to you soon. God bless you. Bye for now.